welcome to Skywarn and Amateur Radio. My name is Scott, call sign N1OF, and I am an Assistant Emergency Coordinator with Hancock County Aries in Hancock County, Ohio. This training is designed to dive into the relationship between Skywarn and Amateur Radio. If you're watching this, I presume you've likely taken Skywarn training before, and if not, that's okay too. Nothing in here will go too far over your head. The National Weather Service does a fantastic job with Skywarn spotter training, but not many dive too deep into the amateur radio aspect of it, and that's what I'm here to do today. Let's go ahead and get started, and I promise I'll try not to put anyone to sleep. This training is designed to cover amateur radio Skywarn net operations and best practices. These were designed by myself as well as others in the Aries leadership team and with our county Skywarn coordinator. If you're watching this from a different area or you stumbled upon this video on YouTube, there are certainly some good points in here, but your local amateur radio Skywarn nets may work differently than this. If you aren't sure or don't know where to start, look into your National Weather Service office's website and check under the Skywarn page. There will likely be a link for amateur radio operations, and you'll be able to find more information there. There is one rule that spotters, net control stations, and emergency communications must follow without fail. Safety. If we as spotters and volunteers aren't safe, how can we help relay information that will maybe save somebody's life? It is imperative that we follow safety guidelines to help ensure everyone can be as efficient as possible in reporting weather events. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with storm spotting from your own home or fixed locations, typically the safest place to be during a storm. However, there are many spotters who choose to go mobile when a storm hits. The National Weather Service does an excellent job in their Skywarn trainings to cover safety, and those procedures and rules should always be followed when storm spotting. However, there are some additional things to consider if you either choose to go out into the storm, or if you happen to be caught in one while out and about and you decide to check into a Skywarn net, and maybe pass some reports of events you come along. One thing we must be clear about, though, Hancock County Aries does not recommend storm chasing. We're not tornado chasers, we don't have a TIV or a tornado intercept vehicle, and I really doubt my SUV is going to survive anything more than a few inches of water. It's just not a good idea. If you're out and following a tornado, it's better to report far away with binoculars and put yourself in harm, or even first responders in harm trying to save you. Have I been out following rotation in our area before? Absolutely. But I never put myself in a situation where I could get hurt, and not just by the storm. People sometimes tend to panic in a rare situation, like a tornado warning around here, and this can cause traffic accidents and carelessness when behind the wheel. So just keep in mind that storm reports from your backyard or your neighborhood are just as important as storm reports from out on the road. Now, if you choose to go mobile, there are several things to consider. The most important thing is pay attention to the road. People already barely know how to drive. Now, imagine they see a large, terrifying shelf cloud rolling in, and they don't know what it is and they get a snapchat from their friend in the next county over with tornado sirens blaring. Do you think that they're really going to be focused completely on the road? Absolutely not. They want to get somewhere safe, maybe check on their kids. There's a million different things they may be going to do. Now, think about yourself. You have to balance your driving, the traffic around you, and then a radio? Don't do it. If you need to use your radio, pull off to somewhere safe, pull into a parking lot, rest area, even someone's driveway if you have to. Just get off the roadway into a safe spot before you use your radio. Whether it's making a report or checking in, you shouldn't use it while you drive. If you're in a situation where you have to go to the shoulder, try and get off the road as far as you can without getting stuck. Put on your four-way flashers and try not to sit there for too long. Heavy precipitation can bring visibility down to near zero, and this increases your chances of getting hit by another vehicle drastically. But whatever you do, do not stop in an active lane of travel. In this area, we experienced a lot of flooding, even flash flooding after a heavy rainstorm. If you come across a roadway that's flooded, don't risk it, just turn around. It really doesn't take much rushing water to sweep you or your vehicle away, and when water is rushing, especially on a road you aren't familiar with, looks can be really deceiving. Even if the water is still and seemingly not that deep, you get water sucked into your vehicle's airbox when it splashes up and now you have an engine replacement on your hands. Several minutes finding an alternate route sounds a lot better than several thousand dollars out of my pocket for a new motor. Let's get into how Skywarn nets function and what you can expect during a severe weather event. If severe weather is expected to impact our area, several different things will usually happen. Aries leadership and our Skywarn coordinator will begin to study the expected weather patterns from the National Weather Service. We'll review discussions from the Storm Prediction Center, keep an eye on local media, radar, as well as the storm's impact to other National Weather Service coverage areas. If conditions are shaping up for severe weather to enter the area, 
Ares leadership and the Skywarn coordinator will work together to share activation plans with local Ares members and Skywarn spotters, usually through email chains or social media. Operators who are trained to work as net control stations will also be contacted, and we will secure primary and secondary volunteers and will schedule more on backup if needed if a weather event is expected to last a significant period of time. Most active spotters tend to self-prepare for weather events when they become aware of severe weather threats to the area. Many tend to monitor local news for weather reports, and many will begin to monitor the Skywarn repeater for the area. Monitoring the repeater before a severe weather event is typically the most effective way of preparedness that we can recommend, since email and social media posts can sit for some time before a spotter is able to see them. Prior to a severe weather impact, it is important to note that Skywarns typically only will activate once the National Weather Service issues a warning for our area. However, it is important to remember that a Skywarn standby net may be issued depending on several circumstances. Standby nets will typically depend on time of day the weather event is impacting our area, the nature of the threat, if a watch has been issued by the National Weather Service, and the likeliness of Skywarn spotters being available. A good example of this actually comes from just a few days before I made the recording for this video. Around midnight or so, we were experiencing a large line of storms coming into our area, and many had tornado warnings attached to them. Leadership was well aware of the threat well before the weather entered our area, and we were prepared to launch a Skywarn net the moment we received the warning. A tornado warning was issued for the county southwest of us, and the polygon began shifting to have a direct impact towards us. Normally, if this were during the daytime, we would have started a standby net to get operators prepared for the impact, but being that it was later at night, we knew that we would have a reduced number of active spotters checking into the net. Luckily, the tornado warning for the neighboring county expired, and we were issued a severe thunderstorm warning. The best way you as a spotter can prepare is to monitor the Skywarn repeater and keep an eye on your email as well as weather reports by local media to help determine when to start monitoring the repeater. When a warning is issued by the National Weather Service for our area, the assigned net control station will begin the Skywarn net. Net control will typically provide a synopsis of the event, usually just by reading the text contained within the issued warning. This will include, among other information, hazards, impacts, and locations affected. Afterwards, net control will provide stations a chance to check into the net. It is important to not check in until you are instructed, as there is a possibility that another station may have priority or emergency traffic that needs to be sent to net control. It is important to remember that Skywarn nets are a directed net, and all operations within the net are under the net control station's direction. These nets are used to provide life-saving information to the National Weather Service. We certainly understand everyone's willingness to help, but it is still recommended that if you are not a trained spotter, you refrain from checking into the net. We encourage you to continue to monitor the repeater. Amateur radio is the fastest way to receive ground truth impacts of a weather event, and it's important to be able to hear if a weather event may personally impact you or your property based on your location. However, and I cannot stress this enough, if you have priority or emergency traffic, regardless of training or not, please communicate with that with the net control station. Once check-ins are taken by net control, depending on the event, net control will provide a set of instructions to those who have checked in. There will typically be a condition code issue, which we'll get to in a couple of slides. There may also be some hazard-specific instructions that net control issues. If you didn't make the first round of check-ins, continue to monitor the repeater and wait for net control to call you for another round of check-ins. And remember, if you have emergency traffic, please call right away. At any point, any amateur operator with emergency traffic may break into the net and will be given priority time. To do this, wait for a break in transmissions, then give your call sign phonetically and state you have emergency traffic. For example, I would say, November 1, Oscar Fox, break for emergency traffic. Net control will immediately acknowledge you and you may pass your traffic. It is important to remember that most of a Skywarn net is radio silence, and this is by design. For safety's sake, our goal is to secure the repeater, close it off to normal amateur use, and keep the air open so severe weather reports can be quickly and efficiently passed. If you turn on your radio and do not hear any traffic, continue to monitor without calling unless you have emergency traffic. Net control will typically have regular intervals where they will ask for check-ins, and you can check in then. Depending on the weather event, it may also be possible that the repeater is placed under a condition where no traffic except severe reports or life-threatening emergencies is to be transmitted. After the storm has passed through, net control will typically close the Skywarn net once the warning has expired. It is not recommended you turn off your radio until the net is officially closed. Although the storm may have seemingly passed and the warning has expired, there may still be reports of damage or environmental hazards that you should be aware of. If you are also an Ares member, 
It's also possible you may be activated for post-storm activities. These announcements may be made if the net is still open or shortly after. Also, the National Weather Service likes to receive damage reports even after the storm has passed. If a storm is significant, the net will stay open. So that was definitely a lot to take in for how nets run, but it is important that we all understand the way they're supposed to function so we can provide the highest quality reports to the National Weather Service and keep everybody safe. Now we're going to explore a bit of the behind-the-scenes work that Net Control does and how your reports are passed over to National Weather Service. Net Control has two basic rules they follow, and they're in this order. First off, Net Control's main job is to ensure the safety of all participants in the Skywarn Net. Secondly, they have to ensure the timely and effective transmissions of reports to the National Weather Service. Net control stations are trained with several different tools that allow them to accomplish this. When you check into the Skywarn Net, Net control will ask for your location and operating position. For example, let's say I checked into a Skywarn Net, started by giving my call during a check-in window. Net control would say, N10F, thank you for checking in, where are you located, and where are you operating from? I would then say, I am located in Finley and I am at home. Or if I were mobile, I'd provide my nearest cross street. Say, net control, I am operating mobile and I am near the intersection of County Road 220 and Ohio Route 37. If you identify as a mobile or portable station, it is a good idea to know that your general location throughout your time on the net. Net control will regularly ask you for your location, especially if reports are coming from your general area. It isn't because they want to babysit you, but if they know where you are, they can provide you direct caution or warning if something were heading your way, or they may ask you about conditions where you currently are. Starting this year, we are encouraging those who participate in Hancock County Skywarn to use APRS if they have it available to them. This helps net control from having to call your station and check in on you and allow you to focus on protecting yourself during the storm or focusing on driving and getting to a safe spot. Use APRS on the normal national frequency, 144.39 MHz, and especially if you are mobile, it is encouraged to set your transmit interval to about every 30 seconds. There are digipeters and eye gates near Finley and Cary that allow for excellent coverage around Hancock County, and they allow for internet mapping. Using APRS.fi, your station will be plotted on a map, and this will visually make things easier for the net control station. In the event internet mapping is unavailable, net control will be trained on how to read point-to-point -point APRS messages to help determine and track your location. Net controllers are being heavily pushed to begin using condition codes on the repeater starting the storm season. Condition codes will be declared depending on the current or expected impacts of the weather event. It is imperative that all spotters who check into the net be familiar with the codes. When a code is issued, a short description will follow that details what net control is expecting from stations. However, there will be situations where transmissions will need to be kept quick, so only the color code may be announced. There are three codes, yellow, red, and black. Each code carries restrictions, with black being the most restrictive condition on the repeater. Condition yellow will be the most common condition during a Skywarn net. Check-ins will be at normal intervals, and all Skywarn criteria reports will be accepted. Please study the chart below. This chart is direct from the National Weather Service, and these will be accepted during a condition yellow. Condition red is a more restrictive condition that may be called during a net. Check-in windows may be suspended during this time depending on the net controller's discretion. Only reports of a severe criteria will be accepted at this time. An example of when this may be used, but certainly not the only case, may be when a severe thunderstorm warning is in progress but conditions are beginning to deteriorate and a spotter announces they have seen persistent cloud rotation or a flash flood is beginning to occur. On this chart, you may see that several of the previous criteria from Condition Yellow are now missing from the chart. Other reports that you may have are certainly important, but if a Condition Red is called, those reports of a lesser urgency will have to wait until a later time. Condition Black is the most restrictive code that may be issued during a net, and not one any net control station would ever want to issue, unless they had to. This condition is used when a life-threatening situation is currently in progress. The most common example, but not the only example, would be a tornado actively on the ground in Hancock County. Only life-threatening reports will be accepted by net control. Radio silence will occur at this time to allow for stations to transmit their severe reports or keep the air open for any operator experiencing a life-threatening situation. Depending on the event, net control may request only specific reports. Using our tornado example, net control may only want reports of the tornado's location and path and would prefer to hold on reports of high water beginning to enter a building. 
In my time as a net controller, I have only declared a high of condition red, and the sad truth is that if a condition black is declared, it is likely that a situation is in progress that is altering lives forever across the county. It's a bit of a grim outlook, but it's important that we are prepared to face that rare but always possible scenario. Let's discuss how your report, once sent through the Skywarn net, makes it to the National Weather Service. Net controllers have several different tools at their disposal, but for the purposes of this training, we will focus on the two main ones that are used, NWS Chat and the District Backbone Nets. NWS Chat is an online, instant messenger type service that connects governmental officials, media, and volunteers like us to the National Weather Service. Typically, only Skywarn net controllers will have access to the system, as well as some members of Area's leadership and the Skywarn coordinator. It is important that any information in the system is not disseminated to the public, as it is a Department of Commerce computer system, and we're not anchors or meteorologists on the news. This is an example of what NWS chat looks like. If anyone remembers AOL Instant Messenger, it has a similar feel to that. A radar interface is provided at the top of the screen, and when in the room, a list of active members will be on the right side. Net control stations may also choose to use district and backbone nets to pass information along to the National Weather Service. These are especially useful if in a situation where internet access is unavailable. In Hancock County, we use the District 1 net as our next step of passing reports. The District 1 net is based on the 375 repeater in Toledo, with KB8 EOC and Bascom as our backup. From there, District 1 passes information along to the National Weather Service using the 6-meter backbone. District 1 is the only district in Ohio that has its own net. Other districts go direct through the 6-meter backbone. The 6-meter backbone uses a 6-meter repeater near Cleveland to accept reports. A good tip to remember, if you are ever in an area that does not have an active local county Skywarn net, you can pass reports direct to the NWS using the 6-meter repeater. National Weather Service has also launched a DMR backbone on Brandmeister's talk group 313932 that is intended to supplement the 6-meter system. Reports may be passed direct through this DMR talk group as well if there is no county net active. A few other miscellaneous things to go over, and believe it or not, we're almost done. National Weather Service goes over some vehicle lighting best practices for spotters, and we support their practices. But if you deck your car or your truck out in flashing lights, it's pretty likely you might cause more harm than good. Although our role in assisting the National Weather Service is important, we're not first responders and there's rarely a situation that a spotter needs flashing beacons on their vehicles. The best practice I recommend is pull off the roadway completely to observe a weather event or to make a report. Parking lots are the best place to go as you get plenty of visibility without remaining in an active roadway. If you're unable to get fully off the road, using your four-way flashers on the shoulders is more than adequate. If you get out of your vehicle to observe an event and you are near an active roadway, wear high-visibility clothing. A simple mesh, high-visibility vest from Walmart or Tractor Supply will be plenty. Keep it in your trunk of your car, and you'll always be ready. Also, if you come across an area of damage while making reports, observe and report the damage from a safe distance. There can be more than meets the eye in an area of damage, and the further away you are, the better. If law enforcement or fire is on scene, you may identify that you are a Skywarn weather spotter and ask for permission to enter the area. Lastly, it is important that we regularly attend Skywarn trainings to keep our knowledge current. Attend a basic Skywarn training at least once a year. The National Weather Service's website is the best place to find information on training dates. If offered as well, consider attending an advanced Skywarn training. The advanced training will give you more tools and resources as a weather spotter and will help you make better informed reports. Also, if you're interested in becoming a Skywarn net control station, we're always looking for motivated individuals. No net control experience is necessary. We will train and help you get up to speed. It's a great way to help give back to our Skywarn community. Feel free to contact our Skywarn coordinator, Evan Hartman, at w8kjr at yahoo.com for net control information or for any questions relating to Skywarn. Thank you for watching this training video, and we look forward to hearing you on the air. 73s, everyone.